Welcome to the Salt Strong Podcast, disrupting fishing entertainment as you know it. Prepare to laugh. Prepare to get to know fishing legends in a whole new and unfiltered way. And on occasion, you might even learn a thing or two about fishing. Here's your host, Joe Simons, like diamonds. Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back again with the podcast. Got a special guest. I met him briefly at iCast through our friend Gary last mm-hmm. year. And uh, Gary sent me a text and he's like, hey, remember that guy I introduced you to? He was like president of Danco. And I'm like, yeah, it rings a bell. And and now I'm hearing what, what you're doing. I was like, man, he's been all over the place. And was it pure fishing and just so much experience. And you and I got on a on a phone call and just started talking about just the industry in general. And there's so many people that... I mean, and I get them, I'm sure you used to get them and maybe still do, but we get them every week that want to be in this industry, whether they want to quit their job and they have a product they're already working on, or they have a prototype, or they want to be a fishing guide, or maybe they just want to like figure out, man, how do I land my dream job, dream job and, and finally just get in the, in the fishing world. And so, uh, Mitch, I'm I'm pumped to have you here uh, with your German name on the Dreisbach. Dreisbach. Yeah. Dreisbach. Very, uh, very, very German. I guess it means uh, three brooks, you know, but I haven't, that's what I've been told. I haven't looked it up. My German isn't that good. So, <laughs> well, and uh, so, yeah, those... thank you. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Excited to uh, be talking to your, uh, to your audience. And, and yeah, the, the experience uh, and background in the industry is kind of put me in a very unique uh, position, um, whether it's a brand manager or product development president. Um, I was a buyer at Dick's Sporting Goods for a number of years. So um, I have a very, uh, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a ball, you only can see that one side of it uh, and you don't necessarily know what's around the corner or all different edges. And so I've really kind of grasped that um, soup to nuts of whether it's, you know, I have a product idea and I don't know where to go to source it, or I have a brand that just wants to go from, you know, a million dollars to $10 million. And I don't know how to scale. Um, You know, when you, if you, if you've run into it, everybody kind of within their different businesses has run into different areas. And and if you don't know the questions to ask, or you don't have the resources, um, you know, to, uh, to kind of confide in, it makes, it makes some of those, uh, those areas challenging and and expensive and time consuming, to be honest with you. And, and now you're doing some consulting for some big brands, even some small companies. And yeah, cool. so I had uh, I stepped out, um, you know, kind of like everybody does when they're when they're starting out with uh, companies and and stepped out and said, you know what, if I'm going to make a run at it, I'm going to I'm going to you know build um, this uh, this brand, this uh, company and uh, and go and do it on my own. So, yes, yeah, so I've started out, stepped out and uh, building a consulting company. Uh, Within the fishing outdoor uh, space, helping brands build their uh, bring their portfolio, whether it's their social media, uh, their product development. Uh, I'm very passionate when it comes to product development, um, and that was kind of back in uh, the pure fishing days, where as, as a brand manager or some of the rod brands, and uh, and develop that sourcing and, and understanding of how to source, where to source, uh, and then really bring that product to to the market, and so. Uh, doing a lot of consulting for publicly traded companies, privately owned companies, uh, big, small, um, really any any area that they need um, help or just guidance as they navigate the the industry. Because um, through those relationships, you know whether they're retail relationships or or brand relationships or sourcing relationships, uh, twenty almost two decades of uh, of experience has kind of has has given me that God has blessed me with that and, and, uh, just being open and honest and trustworthy has, uh, opened a lot of doors. And so I'm excited, uh, for this. And so, yeah, I've been, I've been putting that, uh, content together and, um, and really trying to just what I know in my head and what I've experienced and, and, uh, what I've been paid to do for 20 years is, is starting to, uh, hopefully I can pay off and, and kind of send that forward to a lot of the guys, uh, who are trying to get into the industry, who are, wanting to make a um, a business out of it and and they've taken that hobby you know of the fishing and turning it into a business and there's a there's a big transition there there's a big chasm 
that you got to kind of overcome and helping helping brands and and uh, companies overcome that. Cool. Yeah. So maybe what we'll do is we'll start with your story on how you got in the industry to begin with and how you kind of, you know, moved up the ranks to, to become, you know, president of a big company and then talk about how to even just get your first job. And some of the biggest mistakes that I personally see all the time when people email us with the resumes and it's just, I'm shaking my head. And so we'll share with you what not to do. And then we'll talk about just um, getting in the industry in terms of like a fishing guide or, or uh, something related to the the charter service. And then Talk about, we'll talk about someone who already has a job or their own little small business and they're just trying to scale. I mean, I remember just trying to get to a million was the toughest thing in the world. At first, a hundred thousand is tough. And then from a hundred thousand to a million seems like you're looking at Mount Everest. Like, how is this ever going to happen? But it's like, once you do that and build some systems and processes, it, it, it never gets easy, but it certainly gets easier to, to scale. So Let's start with your story. How did you get in the industry? What was what was your background? Yeah, so I I um I played uh, co- uh, collegiate uh, sports. Uh, after I was done um, playing sports and I was done with my uh, scholarship, I uh, I just got a uh, part time job at a Dick Sporting Goods. Uh, I was I had a, a addiction for fishing and hunting, and uh, and a twenty five percent employee discount was. <laughs> exactly what I needed being a broke college grad. And, uh, and so I just started in the lodge at a Dick Sporting Goods in, um, in Indiana. And, uh, just as that, just, Hey, I'll work part-time and, and do that. And I was bartending, um, and I'm uh, working part-time during the day. And, and that quickly showed me because I didn't know at the time what really goes into all of that product that's on the retail shelf. Right. I mean, between just the merchandising alone of those shel- shelves yep. and and the reasons why that product is where it is based on consumer habits and, at a at a large company like a Dick Sporting Goods just at the retail level um, is massive and there's a lot of there's a lot that go in it so it really opened my eyes to all the the actual business that goes into it and uh, and I was you know 22 23 at the time and really kind of started really diving into that. Um, at the time, Dick Sporting Goods had an initiative to start to try to bring younger uh, people from their stores into their corporate office. There was there was a, a growth strategy that they had, uh, and so they needed some 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 help, or they wanted uh, some associates coming from the stores into their corporate office. So I was blessed enough to be able to uh, to get an interview uh, and. Um, uh, based on some of the work that I had done at the store and um, and went out to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, interviewed all day and uh, and ended up getting the job as a as a merchant in the fishing industry. Uh, and so that's really what started my career was I got thrown into as an assistant buyer, uh, managing rods, reels, combos, saltwater tackle. Uh, for at the time, there was about 350 stores. Uh, and grew that while I was there for the last, the five and a half years I was there up to, you know, 600, almost 700 stores building regional assortments, uh, seasonal assortments with all those categories and all the things that go into the fishing industry, uh, from a retail perspective, uh, working with brands, working with, uh, sourcing factories, working, uh, to build and develop and bring in new product as, you know, all of these big brands, you know, come to obviously the retailer to sell them their product. And so really cut my teeth uh, as a as a merchant. Uh, and then that just kind of just put gasoline on the fire. I, I, I'm passionate about the fishing industry. I love the outdoors. Uh, and being able to take that business, um, that business side and, and really springboard and, and I don't fish as much as I used to, um, because of all the business side. But if I'm gonna, if I'm going to uh, get paid and I'm going to uh, be in the industry, I at least want to talk about it. Uh, I've always said that it's easier the easier talking about um, uh, fishing all day as a business than it is, you know, tampons and tires. You know, I don't know if I could necessarily do that a day in and day out. So if I'm gonna fill up my day, it's gonna be it's gonna be surrounded with uh, with fishing. And so, um, yeah, that you know that kind of springboarded me into pure fishing, where I was a brand manager. Um, developed a bunch of product uh, with them and uh, and managed what, brands. which brand? Uh, so I managed Berkeley Rods, uh, Fenwick Rods, All Star Rods, and then Hodgman Waiters. 
Got it, cool. uh, and so I, um, you know, one of the big projects that I had, um, I had well, two of the real big projects was one bringing Hodgman in. So at the time, <clears throat> Pure Fishing purchased uh, Hodgman from Coleman and brought, brought, uh, brought that brand into their fold. And so learning uh, that whole process of integrating a, you know, a brand within the organization, uh, but then also um, redesigning uh, all-star rods uh, from its long history uh, from Texas uh, and, and redesigning and redeveloping that entire brand to be able to turn it around as it had, had fallen off as far as the um, consumer um, just, it, it was the sales were tough. They didn't have much following. Uh, it was one of those brands that they had bought a number of years prior, but it had continued to de- declined. And so they needed to revamp. And so I completely revamped that all-star uh, series. So that was, a, that was, those were a lot of fun. Uh, and big programs and projects uh, that I had, uh, I was, you know, fortunate to be able to learn and, um, and experience because that's honestly, that's the whole thing within this industry is you get your shot you learn, you're not going to know, you know, I didn't know anything about being a buyer when I interviewed for the job. I was just a energetic, passionate, Hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes and uh, and work hard and be trustworthy and and that's uh, allowed me to kind of continue to piggyback um in my career and just build upon that knowledge and understanding um from position to position and uh, which ultimately led me uh to running uh Danco uh Danco Sports is a accessory company um and uh, here in Florida and uh make tools and accessories and and when I started that uh with that company about oh gosh it'd be about 8 years ago now uh it was it had just it was doing private label product for um for brands and and other retailers uh and really didn't have a brand to per se so really building that brand through the marketing through the social media through the product um, through uh, the customer programs, you know, really taking that and building that that uh, company up uh, into what you see it today at retail and uh, through social media um, is uh, is kind of what's it's led me into uh, into what I'm doing today and uh, and what is it ultimately excites me because that entrepreneurial helping um, talking about different things every day um, whether it is how to build my business to, Hey, I need a, I just need to source some components, um, with, uh, to help lower costs. You know, all those things are important to people's businesses. And, uh, and that's what excites me today is that I get to, I get to do something fun every day. And, you know, and today is a, uh, as a podcast. Yeah. Know? I love it. Yeah. And you get, yeah. you guys did a fantastic job with Danco. Cause when Luke and I started Saltstrong, that was eight years ago, and that would have been our first iCast and I never heard of Danco. Right. Um, and we got invited to go. You guys didn't even have a booth like you rent out like a small little conference room yeah. in the in the yeah. back. And we're waiting uh, for someone to come out to help us. It, it wasn't you. Uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but all of a sudden the door opens up. There's a little private meeting room and it's Johnny Morris. I'm like, that's Johnny Morris. Like, I'm like <laughs> starstruck. I was like, what, what's he doing here? Meet with Danco in this little janky little like conference yeah. room. Yeah. And then yeah. I started putting two and two together and you, I won't fill you know the details. You guys can maybe connect the dots, but yeah. you mentioned you guys were doing a lot of like private label stuff. I was like, wow, like Danco's doing a lot of, of stuff. They just yeah. didn't do a good job with their own brand until you know last. It wasn't a priority, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So that was the that was the thing is that it was just um, you got to have those priorities and understanding where your goals and your strategies are. And at that point, it wasn't a priority. Um, and uh, and until we decided that it was, um, then you start to kind of shift your focus as a company. But you you know every company needs to have its goals and its priorities and uh, and how they're going to attack them. And when and uh, and and it's not about you know not being able to do it. It's just when you want to do it to to maximize your overall um, you know profitability and portfolio. Yep. All right. Well, yeah. Let's... So so we're definitely we definitely are kind of the guys behind the uh, the guys. You know we've yeah. I I always I always tease. You know I've uh, I've been a part of a lot of um, iCast uh, new product showcase wins. You know, uh, over the years, I've never been on stage. I've never, I've never got help. I get the help hold it, but uh, I'm always sitting in the back drinking a beer, saying, "I, I, I did that." I did, yeah, you know. That's so um, some our yeah. our product there. That's cool. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um. 
so let's move to just getting your first job because that, that's what a lot of people want is, you know, the, it seems like a lot of younger people in general, but they send us an email with a resume saying, I just, I don't like what I do. It's in, you know, ABC insurance company, whatever it is. I really just, I love fishing. I'm so passionate about it. I want to help people. How, how do I get in there? And I will start off by saying, and you did a great job of sharing your story. So much of it is just getting your foot in the door. Mm-hmm. I've seen an ICAST people that I meet one year that have, and I'm not picking on any companies here, but they'll have a Shimano badge on and they'll be representing Shimano. And the next year they're at Pure Fishing or whatever, or Iowa, it doesn't matter. And same with even the big motors. Like I remember one guy, he was pitching us so hard on Yamaha and the next year he's over at Mercury. Yep. But it's like, once you get in and can show that you're capable of helping a brand out, you know, you you do have a lot of opportunities to uh, to move your way up, whether Absolutely. it's inside of that company or, or a different one. It's just, meaning yeah. it's a small industry once you're in it. It it really is a very small industry, and and um and you will be. I tell people this all the time. You you would be very surprised how small the industry is once you get, uh, kind yeah. of through the curtain, if you will. Uh, and and I'm, I, I because I'm a product of it. Go and start at retail. Yes. Go and work at your local retail store, whether that's a West Marine, a Dick Sporting Goods, an Academy, a Bass Pro, doesn't matter. If it could be an independent that that you that you is down the street. Everybody has a local fishing store that is um that's that they love to shop at or that is in the go start there because what you're gonna do. Now being an, a, a, uh, an associate at one of these stores, you might be stocking shelves. You might be unboxing product. It doesn't matter. The point is you're now, now all of a sudden you're going to meet the rep. Yep. So now that sales rep that comes into that store who is a manager of a, of a brand or is hired as because he's an outside sales rep for, you know, maybe six or eight different brands. All of a sudden you meet him or her and you create a relationship with that, but they see your work ethic and they say, man, because listen, at the end of the day, it, it's, and you know this from running your company, I know this from running my company, to find good help that's yep. consistent, yep. that is trustworthy, that is energetic, and that that you can count on is very hard to find. As you would think it would be easy to find, <laughs> it's not easy to find. And so if you're going to go in and you're going to work a six-hour shift three days a week at a at an independent fishing store, you're going to make and learn so much about the industry, the trends of the industry, what's working uh, from a product standpoint, how to merchandise, how does it actually sell, how to sell? Because if you can learn to sell to a consumer, you know, I see so many, especially kids these days who don't, can't even make eye contact when you talk to them because all their, their face is in their phone all the time. You know, you can cut down on that barrier and you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, what do you, you know, can I help you with something? You know, most fishermen, when you're in the store, you know, uh, no, I'm good. Because as a fisherman, you know everything, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> and so working on your approach, uh, hey, yeah, you know, those those new uh, chartreuse skirts on that uh, chatterbait. You know, I was I was out there trout fishing the other day and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, you're selling, but you're just telling stories. And so you learn how to do that at retail and you you learn how to ha- communicate to that to those consumer. It's going to help you build those relationships with those reps. Those reps are going to take notice. Uh, and when opportunities come up for maybe another position that they need a uh, uh, or somebody to help set up a show, and that now and all of it is, hey man, I remember Johnny over at Fish and Frank's, and uh, and he was really spot on at that ten event. Can you call him and have him come over and help us with some demo? I mean, it just happens that yep. fast. And uh, so I would say if it would be one piece of advice to get in the industry is start at retail and uh, at your local retail, at your local independent or uh, mass merchant and uh, and get in and you're you'll be surprised how many contacts you make. No, that's it. And and you might even discover your big product idea. Right. You know, there's that. so many stories I've heard from how a product actually the things that we know today that, oh, man, it started from. A young guy being in a tackle store saying, man, if they, if this company would just change up this one just thing, I, I know it works better. And, and all of a sudden it's, it's an invention. And what's funny in my prior life and financial services, I wanted to be a financial planner. That was like my big goal. And so I started with AG Edwards and this was like in my process of trying to get licensed to be able to trade stocks. 
So very similar to being just like a stock boy. I was the do boy. I'm shredding papers, yep. like shredding old files and just meeting with people. And the variable annuity wholesalers, same as like the, the reps, the, the reps would come in and buy us lunch. And I started talking to these reps. They're all young guys as well. And they're in their 20s and they got these nice cars and they're getting to travel. And I'm single. I'm 23 years old. And mm -hmm. I was like, so you're making six figures, like just traveling around buying people lunch. And I was like, that mm -hmm. sounds pretty cool. <laughs> and that's what I ended up doing. So I ended up yeah. I ended up leaving that job. And just because of that one, that one connection I met with this uh, one young guy that I hit it up with. And next thing you know, I was making six figures pretty quickly and getting to you know travel and, and meet all kinds of new people. And it it just kept opening up more and more doors, but it all started off starting small. I want to talk about a mistake that that I see if you're a little stubborn and maybe you don't want to work in a retail store, maybe you already tried it. The thing that that I see over and over again in my inbox from a lot of younger people that 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 are dying to get a job in the industry and they'll send us the resume and it, you know it's a few little things they've done here and there and i always reply back so if you ever email me maybe you have and i was like all right what's what's your superpower like wh what do you just absolutely love doing um and they just come back with oh, i can do anything i just want to be in the industry like and I, I shared this offline. I was like, never in my wildest years have I told our leadership team, I'm just looking for someone who could do anything. Normally, it's That's something right. specific. It's someone, I need someone to run our tackle store. Or I need someone, a graphic designer. I need someone to run our ads. I need someone who's going to be in charge of rods only. I need a specific person. And so I would say, if you get that opportunity again with me or anybody else, always come up with something specific. And the next level... This is what, to me, separates the, the B and C players from the A player. The next level is spending some time on their site or in their store and finding a little problem, even if it's something super small, and it, just letting them know about it. And or even the next step is like, hey, I got a fix for it. And you'll be surprised how many people get hired that way. I I share with you. Mitch, oh yeah, you, I mean, graphic designer that just did that. It's it's crazy. That's right. I mean, don't don't come and try to. Oh, I, well, I can do anything. I you know, <laughs> or hey, how can I help you? You know, you uh, go back to the retail uh, analogy, right? Like most fishermen be like, I got it. Yeah. You know, most brands be like, I got it. Okay, but if you come in and say and and start saying, hey, here's a problem I've identified, and to your point, go further and say. Here's the solution that I recommend based on my perspective or based and, on my experience. And I'll do it for you. <laughs> and and then you take it a step further and say, here it is. Yeah. All of a sudden you're saying there, you know, you you go and you show your like your to your point, you show your graphics guy and say, like, hey, what do you well, I I didn't think about that's a, that's amazing. I never th even thought of that because because you're so many times these brands you get you get caught up in the details or okay. I cast it 70 days away. I gotta, we gotta do this. Blah, blah, blah. And you're, so you're so quick to try to, you know, get the, what you need to done now. You, you forget that, well, there is a consumer out there. There is a, um, a, a seasonality. Component. There's all these things that goes into it to where you get an outside perspective and it's like, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But to, to somebody trying to get into the industry, to your point, absolutely. Don't, come to me and tell me that you can solve my problems, solve the problem, see it, yeah. identify it and solve it. Now, you might be totally off. You might completely whiff at it. So what? Like, at least it shows me one is going to show me your body of work. It's going to show me your ability to be uh, a self starter. Right. And it's going to show me kind of what you can do, whether it is a graphic design or if it is product development or it is your eye by you putting your body of work out there and um, and, and, and submitting it. It tells me a tremendous about am uh, amount about you because you're not you, you can't be scared of taking risks, you can, especially in this business, you know, in any business, you can't be afraid of. You know, it's that whole analyze, uh, what is it? Analyze and um, uh, to paralysis, analysis to paralysis. You know, you sit there and you kind of analyze it all and you don't ever move or do anything. You've got to make those, you know, dis <laughs> obviously those sound decisions based on history and, uh, and what how things have worked, whether it's your ads or it's your product development. You know, you're going to take some some history there, but at the same time, you're going to have to put it on the table a little bit and, uh, and be willing to take a risk. And th there's no reason why you don't or shouldn't 
as a um, as a new uh, potential hire coming into this industry, see a problem, solve the problem, and then solve it for me. And if you can if you can show me that you can solve a problem again, honestly, I've hired people where it's like, hey, you are completely wrong. Like you might see it like it was a it was a complete whiff. But you know what? I do have this opportunity because all the things you show me. So even when you make the mistake, even if it's completely wrong, I'm still I see those intangibles that you just presented to me that I want in my for my company and I want around me to make me better, to make my team better, that I'm going to go, I'm going to go find it. Might be a stock position. It might be a warehouse position. But at the end of the day, I'd re- much rather have a bunch of people that are uh, that I can I, that I can slow down and pull the reins back a little bit versus yeah. having to kick them in the butt all the time. Because you know, as business leaders, you don't have the time uh, to 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 motivate. You know, those that should be one of those uh, and showing up on time, being mode self motivated. You know, those are intangibles that you should that should be in, enshrined in you um, and uh, and stuff that I look for and that we all look for as business leaders. One hundred percent and. I think another another piece of this, especially in this day and age, is to become a specialist and become known as like if you become become like the best or the go to person in in an industry or niche, you're always going to have an opportunity. You're always going to be able to get raises. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at it anything. Like if if you had a, a a problem tomorrow and you woke up and your retina was scratched and like you think you have a torn retina. You're not going to go to a general doctor, right? You're not going to even, you might not even go, to, you shouldn't go to an optometrist. You might not even go to a general ophthalmologist. You're going to say, I want a retina specialist, someone who only works on retinas. And guess what? That retina person who might only see like five people in a day versus a normal person might see, a normal doctor sees 40 or 60, they're getting paid like four to five times more because they are an absolute specialist at one thing. And that's just one of a million stories you can, uh, you can share. And I mean, one of our highest, you know, paid guys, I mean, he is an absolute expert. He's the best I've found in the entire industry at building all the the IT stuff and, and uh, even the systems, like the automation that happens behind the scenes, that, that's a special skill set to yeah. know, like, for instance, if you opt into our website today, we know exactly what you came from and we know what you've bought and haven't bought. You know, a lot of companies just send the same stuff to everyone. We've got different emails going out all times of the day to all different types of people. And that took a lot of time to build, but it was because we had a specialist that reached out and said, Hey, I know this stuff in and out. Here's what I can do with all your data. And we're like, all right, you're hired. And guess what? He's right. hired for as long as he wants the job. Yep. Cause it, yeah. It's so yeah. Cause he does it. He does it well. And he, and he executed, but you, but you're not going to go have him do product development. You're yeah. not going to have him go uh, and be uh, uh, in, in front of the camp. You know, right. there's those specialists that you have. Absolutely. They are key to your organization uh, and being able to find those and capture those uh, are, are super, super critical for sure. Yep. And there's just so much information out there these days. You can you can go get a master class or read books on in, or watch YouTube videos to your blue in the face on any topic that you want yeah. uh, just to become a little bit of an expert. To your point, there's a lot of young people in particular that just kind of coast in, in my eyes. And the ones who are like absolute, like you said, they're joyful to be around, they're coachable and, and they're kind of self-starters and they just wake up smiling and like have a good attitude Man, you're, I, I will hire them all day long, and they stand and they yeah. stand out yeah. like you wouldn't believe. Yep. I mean, it is a it's a candle yes. in the dark. Uh, Absolutely, it's it's, re- it's remarkable. Uh, it's remarkable, and so I would just uh, challenge. I would challenge you know whether it's uh you know the young guys coming up or the um you know the the forty and fifty year old guy who just can't seem to break into the industry that. You know, it's the the intangibles are are there for a reason, and yeah. uh, and they're super important. So don't limit yourself into yeah. what into into what you think you are or what you can be, because you know you you set some of those tones. Uh, you're going to stand out um, more than you think you than you re- really know. Yep, I love it. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, the kind of the guide business briefly, and then we'll move over to someone who has a current business or current product or a prototype that's just, that's trying and just can't scale. Cause I I think that that's so important. And it's what I wish someone had helped me out with when when we first started salt trunks, we, we struggled those first two years were brutal. Um, So let's talk about the guides real quick. Cause I I do see a lot of 
people who have that dream of becoming a fishing guide mm -hmm. and they finally either quit their job or do it part time. And the usually their first month or so is pretty good because they've, they've got friends, they have family, they have people that have just kind of watched them on social media, whatever, and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll book a charter with you. And then all of a sudden they wake up after 30 or so days and there's just nothing there. Yeah. As in yeah, like, I mean, no one's, the, no one's calling, no one's emailing, right, like what, right. what's, what happened? Yeah. I, I, and I think it goes back to that business strategy. If they didn't have a strategy going in before they, they created that website, before they created that, uh, that uh, phone number or that YouTube channel or that Instagram, if they didn't have, um, that brand vision, uh, or that, that strategy, then, then that 30 day window that was all of a sudden, oh, everything was great. And now they can't seem to, uh, gain any more business. They're going to fall into that, that lull, if you will. Right. Yep. So it is so important to have and understand what your value proposition is, no matter what business you are in. What value am I going to provide to my customers? Because the, listen, I've done it. You've done it. Uh, every brand has done it, whether it's a, a brand that you see uh, uh, an icon on the side of a shoe, or it's a guy on a YouTube channel who is trying to uh, building his consulting business. You have to have a, a value proposition that you're going to get your customers. What are that? What is that customer going to gain by hiring you? doesn't matter what it is. And so many people think, well, it's, it's, I, I don't have a widget. It's not a product, but yes, it is. Your product is you. Yep. And, uh, and, and I see a lot of guides fall into this because they don't have, they have, they, they aren't looking at themselves as a product. You know, I'm a product, you're a product. What I offer and what I can, the value proposition that I can give to my customers our experience, knowledge, relationships. Those are my value propositions. What you offer your customers is the same thing, right? You have a value proposition and a vision that you have established that is consistent through your content strategy, your brand strategy, your goals and your initiatives for your company. It's no different. And so when a guide starts and you know he might be a flats guide or a, or a, a wade fishing guide in Texas, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't matter. But the point is, is what are you going to provide? What is that value you're going to provide to your customers? Now, we can say, well, that's catching fish. Okay. But how often have you been on a fishing a trip? And I've done it. I've, I've hired guides. I've been around guides my entire career. I've had trips that I caught the pants off of uh, of fish. We had at one point you had six sailfish. They're all one's going to Cuba, one's going to Key West. <laughs> and I mean, you would have been like this thing, but it was miserable because the guide was a prick. Yeah. He just, it just, he didn't have, he didn't understand the customer. He, we caught a pile of fish. I mean, from a fish, pure fishing standpoint, it's like, psh, dang, that was a day. But no, you know, you're a guy in, in Milwaukee and this, and you're coming down to Florida and you just, you just want to get out in the sun. You want to fish. You want to have four hours. It doesn't matter if you're catching, um, if you're catching snapper or, or jack or catfish. Like you're just happy to be on the water in Florida fishing. And so, yeah. your value proposition isn't the quality of fish because he could give two rats if it's a snook or tar. And, and how many of those clients for that guide is the same way? to where they don't really care about the quality of the fish. They're just wanting the quality of the trip. And so I've been on trips where I didn't catch squat. I had an awesome time because the guide had his value under proposition understood. And he was an, he's an entertainer. Yep. I mean, that's you're on the boat for four to six hours, maybe eight hours. You know, and a lot of those, those people that come down and, and they want to 60% of your business you know, maybe it's it's lower than that, but you're going to have a segment of your business that is going to be one time, you know, yep. but you're trying to convert them into repeat customers, right? You want to turn 80% of your business into, into return business. How do you do that? So you've got to have and establish that value proposition early so that you, uh, so that that customer can understand what they're getting and come back for. And so from a guide's perspective, it, 
again, it's no different than building a brand. Uh, and you have to understand what that customer wants, what they desire, uh, and what you can offer them outside of just catching fish. Because like I said, you can be a complete jerk and uh, and and catch you know hundreds of, of redfish and be the best red fisherman, but you're not going to get those return clients or the word of mouth. Yep. Um, so that's one big part of it. Obviously, you know, being that customer service availability, you know, there's so many things today uh, that I see when, you know, I'm on the boat with a guide and he's taking phone calls, you know, oh, hold, let me call you back this evening. You know, how many business uh, a touch points and leads, right? What we would call leads um, are being missed because he's mismanaging those leads, right? He doesn't know how to capture them. He doesn't have a way to capture them. Uh, so now he's interrupting his client. So he's not giving the full attention to his client because he's taking phone calls all day, which is, you know, you're in the phone, middle of a conversation. My phone rings. It's very disruptive, right? Uh, my attention goes to them versus you. Uh, and so ha- there's programs like, you know, there's so many programs um, that can help you manage your calendar um, in this day and age uh, that are subscription-based stuff you know, for your website. So it automatically can just be fed through there. And so being able to have that customer service and availability um, is important because they just don't know, you know, people call, hey, are you available this day or that day? You know, they spend hours, hours, you know, either missing the call or not taking the call, getting the call back. And so having that customer service, obviously, um, is a big uh, is a big part of it. But yeah, that value proposition, man, being entertaining, uh, yeah. is uh is super critical and you know obviously that even, that doesn't even get into that doesn't even get into like it you know the 14 to 16 hours a day that is going to take you to be successful to be yeah. a guide but that's a whole nother podcast a whole nother element but um you know but i'd also say that the the other part is is partnering with brands and companies that you use it's not being a pro staffer. It's not being a brand ambassador. It's not any of that stuff, but there's no reason why you can't share that content with those companies unsolicited. They're always, you know, you're always looking for content. You're always trying to build content. And if if you have somebody who's just feeding that to you, I mean, I look at that as some, as as free advertising. I mean, of course, I'm going to send my fishing pictures to a brand and uh, and fire those off to them and, and figure out a way to to uh, get in with that marketing person to be able to just to provide what they need. And again, solving the problem and not waiting to be told what the problem is, but solving finding that um, issue and solving that sol- and giving them a solution um, is uh, you know is important. And yeah, as a guide, you're on the water. You know, you're on the water uh, what forty hours a week. You know, and you have a unique. You know, your value proposition to those brands is different than what it is to the consumer. And understanding that, that you do have a value proposition to the brand as well um, is another part. It's just understanding the voice of the consumer. You know, you might, you know, be here with your customer, but understanding what, how you can build your brand and build your company, if it's a, a guide business, to help yourself with uh, brands within the industry. I mean, there's there's so many el- elements uh, to that that you can be successful because I'm not on the, I can't go get co- on the water content freely. You know, I'm, I'm in the office and most people within the industry are that way. And so you have your, you have a very unique pos- position um, as a guide uh, to be of a service uh, to people. And it's not just grip and grin fish pictures. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think what I'm about to share kind of piggybacks into the next piece of this is someone who already has a business or even just an idea or prototype. And it's it's looking for opportunities to be different, looking for opportunities to stand out from the crowd. Uh, I'll quick story to kind of share this example down in the, in the Florida Keys. You know, a lot of us think of tarpon fishing, right? And uh, maybe even, fly, you know, catching a bonefish on the fly. But tarpon fishing in general is one of the big things that that a lot of the guides focus on. And there's a guy, Captain Mark Johnson, they call him Hollywood. And he grew up down there his whole life. And he saw that happening. There was this mass, massive, like, just glut. I mean, there's just too many guys and they're all focused on tarpon. And 
you know, you get down there and all it was all the same. They might, yeah, they might have a different, you know, Maverick or, you know, different colored boat, but it was, they almost looked all the same. And he's like, man, I'm, I'm never going to really succeed if I'm just competing against people who are all doing this exact same thing. And he started looking for opportunities like, all right, what's, what's one thing that's a little bit different that, that I can still be a captain fishing, but I don't have to focus on tarpon. And he started realizing a lot of these guys, he was taking tarpon fish and they're like, oh man, it'd be, it'd be cool if like my wife, and my kids could come along, they're back at the hotel or they're, you know, checking out the worldwide sportsman or whatever. And, and he's like, yeah, cause they just don't like to sit here and, you know, cause tarpon fish can be really boring. I mean, you might wait all day to get that one, that one good bite. And so Mark had like a light bulb moment opportunity. Wait a minute. Maybe I can focus on the whole family. And he did. And he started capitalizing on all the barracuda and the jacks and the sharks and, and Spanish yeah, mackerel. Right. Seriously. And, and now he's got four boats. All he's the got, bycatch. Yeah, he's got a <laughs> fleet. And these are the fish that no one, no other guides down there are focusing on. They're, like you said, it's all bycatch. And people made fun of him. They're like, dude, you're a joke. Like, and now he's sitting there laughing, saying, I got four boats and four guys underneath him. And he's busy all the time because he's created a niche for himself. And, and if you call him and say, hey, I want to go tarpon fishing. He's like, I'm not your guy. I'll refer you to these 20 other guys here at the same marina. But he goes out there every day and he's just focused on catching jacks. And for someone out of town, if you came from Ohio. Now listen, you, how yeah. fun is it? How yeah. fun is it to go and catch you? You're from Indiana and you come down here and you boat 30 to 40 ladyfish. Yeah. How fun is that? You know, you we look at that and be like, it's another ladyfish. Make yeah. sure it doesn't, you know, turn it around. So it doesn't, you know, all over the boat. Yeah. But for for them, it's just. It's a poor man's tarpon. And it's like, oh my gosh, we had a great day because it's just, it, it's fish. It doesn't matter. And so that's just understanding that customer and, and that value proposition. He understand, he understood it. He yep. grasped, he, he tailored his business around that and he focused on it. And that's where you, 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 you then you start to become successful. Um, to your point, you've got to kind of niche down a little bit to, to figure out what that, uh, what your, again, Figuring out what your market research, what your competitors are doing, what they're not doing, and how can I dif- differentiate myself to be able to go after my market, yep. it, whether it's the guide business or it's your it's you know building a, a new a new product. It's the same way, but being able to have that uh, that strategy in place and that understanding of how to build that foundation so that you can uh, be successful. It's, yeah, that's that's a perfect example. Of uh, you can take that analogy anywhere within the within business or, or the fishing industry for sure. So what what are some of the common mistakes that that you've seen and continue to see in this industry when someone comes up with their idea, they got it, it's now a business. They've sold some, but they're just not getting traction and they can't scale. What what are the bigger issues on on scaling? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different areas. Whether it's you know you have your idea. Uh, and you know, and, oh, I've got this great widget, right. And this is the next best thing. Um, that product idea is, is unique. Um, and you know, and I've got, you know, and I want to take this business or this idea and turn it into a business. So, you know, a lot of guys, what they'll stop with is really, there's, you know, seven to eight kind of stages of that kind of product development, but there's three main kind of touch points and hurdles that if you are, if you start moving to step four without starting these, this real uh, big kind of pinnacle um, step, you're going to miss it. So I mean, obviously you've got product, you know, you're, you, you've identified the product, you say, I've got this new lure or this new jig or this new rod or new whatever it might be. Uh, and I want to take it to and, and start. Well, you're going to have to do your obviously your market research, figuring out what my competitors are, figuring out what my um, my my brand awareness is. It is is my product different in the market? Is my product going to be different um, in um, to my competitors? Or are there a bunch of products out there from a price point to uh, where it's going to sit and how it's going to position itself? Obviously, developing that concept through outlining what the features are and identifying those potential benefits of that product are all important. But what happens is, so you've got the product idea, 
you've got the market research done, you've got the concept all buttoned up and, and you know what your widget is. And then you start moving to step four. Well, before you move to step four, you've got to start establishing your sourcing. Because as you get into step four, which would be designing and developing the product, you're not going to know how much the material is going to cost. Is that material going to be available? How am I uh, How am I going to build those prototypes so that I can start to, because step four or five are more detailed into that product to where if I can't establish those, answer those questions of what's the lead time going to be for when, I, when, when this thing comes to market, uh, how much is it going to cost me? Where am I going to position it? How am I going to position it? You've got to really back up and see, figure out where my sourcing uh, element is uh, and how that's going to fit into it. Then you can start getting into that whole design development, um, detailing out specifications, the materials, because you can answer those questions, right? Because now you have a sourcing partner to help answer those. I don't necessarily know when a customer comes to me and asks me how much it's going to cost to build X, Y, and Z. I have, I have to go and and rely on it goes back to your person who is a who is an expert in that field and certain categories and and certain factories are are uh, and suppliers are good in certain category areas and but I'm not going to go ask a lure manufacturer to quote me a rod because that's just not their business yeah and so understanding that piece and then obviously testing and refining that product um, is uh, is super critical you know to understand gaining feedback from your consumers gain feedback from the market. You know, you're not going to launch and spend the time on a on a new lure if it doesn't if it rolls over every time you throw it or it comes off the hook every time you cast it, uh, or it only catches it gets two bites and um, you know and 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 falls apart. Uh, and so you you know that's where that development and ideation and and testing and refinement of that product comes in. But well, then so then most people what they'll do is like, okay, I know the product, I've got the market research, uh, I have a sourcing. I've developed the, the the strategy. I've developed and refined it. It's perfect. It's ready to go. And so then they then they go to marketing and say, "Oh, well, I'm going to launch it. Here's how I launch it. Here's the website that I'm going to do. Here's the branding. Here's the marketing." Well, that's great, but how, establishing before you do the marketing, before you establish the launch plan, you've really got to understand what is the distribution channel. That I'm going to go after, yes. Because if you don't have a distribution channel, whether that's your own supply chain, whether that is uh, going through a distributor or a direct to retail, direct to consumers, if you don't know what your distribution channel is, entire marketing budget is just a just burn it because you're not going to be able to tell your consumers where to go. So understanding your distribution channel before you start building your marketing content, and how to launch because if you can't tell your consumers where to go to find it, whether that is your local tackle store, going to mass merchants uh, and, uh, and you know big box company sco- stores or um, or online, you know you're you're you've got to have that all established before you know your marketing. So that's a, that's that second really big kind of touch point that you want to make sure that you um, you know that you establish before before you continue to kind of move forward and then obviously you're you know building that marketing developing that marketing strategy the product the packaging um the launch the seasonality of when to launch um and all of those pieces really are important from an outward facing from a brand but really establishing what that distribution channel and how going to uh, lay out is is going to be important yeah and, and i think Always looking forward as well. You know the companies that that don't just grow but have massive growth. They they have a vision. To your point, you're kind of thinking it's ahead. Success. Yep. But so much of it is just having the vision. I'll, I'll share a couple little things that happened to us as we started getting into the lure business. You know, it it if you got a great lure that works, Slam Shady was our first one. It wasn't that hard to sell. But when we started talking about really scaling it. 
and then having to buy our own molds, like a true production mold where you could be doing, you know, thousands a day, not just, you know, selling you know, 50 or 100 here, which is really the way to scale and be profitable. You know, we had to invest $10,000 just for that production mold. That, that's a lot of money. And then even the the bags, the packaging is something a lot of people don't think about. You know, we had this guy at he, I won't, I won't say exactly what it was, but it was a, it, it was a piece of equipment, and and he had, and it was kind of bulky, and it was actually really good piece. It was, he did a great job with the product, but I was like, well, what about the packaging? Oh, I didn't even thought about that yet. And I'm like, well, dude, that that could get pretty expensive, especially if you have something bulky. I mean, to put a perspective, if you and I, Mitch, just went out and tried to go buy, you know, a, a hundred custom bags for, you know, for soft plastic lures. That could be seventy five cents a, a pack. I mean that that eats in a lot to your margin. If you also have a middleman distributor or you're going into retail, uh, obviously you can get it down to to pennies if you're buying tens or hundred thousands at a time. But all these little things that most people don't ask enough questions to say, all right, if if I do take this to the next level, you know how wh- what 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 are some barriers that could hurt me. Uh, and then also, you know, what are some economies of scale that I could benefit from as, uh, as well? Uh, and a lot of times that's just taking the the breather, if you will, because to me, that was our problem is we we couldn't see out of the weeds because we were just going so fast and just trying to make a buck. And we never really took the time to sit back and like, all right, let's talk about the big vision. What what do we want this to look like in three years? beginning with the end in mind and then backtracking. All right, if we want to look like this, here's all the things that we have to do versus just doing and doing and doing uh, every single day. It, uh, it, it'll, it'll absolutely burn you out. So a big part of it is just having that vision, a written down like vision and a mission of exactly what you want your company or product or service to look like in a year, two, three, five years from now as well. All right, so Mitch, we covered a ton here on a lot of different stages of the fishing industry. I know this is what you're doing now, you know, for a living as a, as a, on the consulting side of things, how do people reach out to you regardless if they're a a massive brand already, uh, or if they're just trying to do, you know, some product development or just trying to get a, a business to scale, what's the best way to reach you? Yeah. So I'm on, uh, obviously social media, like everybody else these days, um, uh, through whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Um, you can find uh, all of the content that I'm putting out there is uh, at the strategy Sherpa. Uh, and uh, and so that can uh, you can go on and, and I'm putting a bunch of YouTube stuff out there, really diving deep into a lot of these areas to help people um, develop their brands, develop their strategies. Uh, you also can go on my website, uh, Dreisbach and Sons. Uh, dot com and uh, and I have my calendar up there and and kind of everything that I provide to uh, to customers uh, and clients uh, whether it's developing product or developing their strategies um, yeah that's those are kind of where you can find me it's whether it's at the strategy Sherpa or on my website uh, Dreisbach and Sons dot com cool and it's D R E I S B A C H correct A N D sons.com perfect cool brother well this was uh this was great i know this is going to help up some people and um and, and hopefully you guys can reach out to mitch the guy knows this stuff you know it's uh it's amazing how much you can learn in a couple years in this industry when you've been there for a decade or more in all those different roles uh it, it really is wild and even just the the rolodex and the and the you know the connections that someone like mitch can uh, help out with it's um i mean to me it's kind of like going on, you know, Shark Tank and uh, but Mitch is not asking for part of your company, uh, you know, but having just those connections, because that's a lot of what Shark Tank is. I mean, they're kind of yeah. open up the Rolodex for their, you know, just different distribution channels and partners to take your idea and make it a whole lot bigger and to scale it. So, uh, Mitch, thank yeah. you uh, so much for coming on. And um, yeah, I'm looking looking forward to speaking more with uh, with you. I got some kind of crazy outlandish ideas as, uh, as well and uh, maybe find some uh, ways to hire you yourself. So. Yeah. Hey, listen, keep doing what you're doing. You guys are, are providing an awesome service to the industry and, uh, and, and it's wor- working really well. And I, and, uh, and I just commend you for, for the, uh, the talent and the education that you put on, uh, for, for consumers, because, um, you know, it's a, uh, I, I see it and I see it working uh, real well. And, and listen, getting people in the industry is what we all want to do, right? We yeah. want to get more people in the industry. We want to get more consumers, 
obviously fishing and more talented people within the industry to make it continue to keep it innovative and grow. And so um, that's kind of my desire and what my um, value proposition is, is how can I get more people in the industry to help it grow and be more competitive and be impactful? So um, I, I, yeah, I appreciate the time and, and I'm excited to see where this goes. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, brother. All right. Take care. Thanks, Mitch. All right. Bye-bye. Cause fishing, it's in my soul. It was passed down to me from the days of old. Find us on the water if there was a way. It's been said my papa, he wrote a book on catching big reds and 20-pound snook. I wish I knew. Souls to stay.